Well, what's up, Red Rock Church fam? Hope you guys are doing great. This is such an exciting day in the life of our church that for the very first time, we get to experience church online. All right, now I know that uh, these are under odd circumstances with the coronavirus happening and, and it forcing us to not be able to gather together physically. These are obviously less than ideal circumstances. And so the reason we aren't gathering today physically or next Sunday, March 22nd, is that we believe it's the most responsible way that we can follow Jesus' example to love one another. That Jesus was all about loving people. And right now the best way we can love people is to prioritize the needs of our hospitals, of our first responders, of our communities, to prioritize the needs of the most vulnerable in our community and in our country. And so that's why we're doing, this is not a decision based in fear, this is based in love. And so we're excited though, because we think this is an opportunity for us. You know, the, the, the church is not a building, the church is a gathering of people. And so thanks to technology, we can stay connected in the weeks to come. And so here's how this is gonna roll, all right? Uh, you're gonna see all kinds of resources below for your family to experience church online. You're gonna see stuff for your preschool age kids through Wombaland, for your elementary age kids through Upstreet, for your students, your middle, your middle and high school students through Transit and Red Rock students. You're gonna see all kinds of age appropriate content and experiences for you all to enjoy and take in together at home through Church Online. You're also gonna see a, a, a worship playlist that you can download and begin worshiping together as a family throughout the week. You're gonna see the chance to express prayer requests, the chance to take next steps. Like if you decide today that you're ready to join a team, if you're ready to join a group, if you're ready to start giving financially, all of those are, are, are options for you today. Your entire church experience through church online. And we believe it's a great opportunity for us to continue to do what Jesus is already doing here, to discover more of him, and to begin following him even more fearlessly. So take advantage of that today as a family. And so what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna jump into a message that I preached just a couple years ago. Uh, you'll notice I've got a little different haircut, might be about 10 pounds lighter, maybe. Um, but it's, it, 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 it's a message that's all about how to respond to fear and anxiety, and, and really how to have the peace that comes from following Jesus. And so whether you're scared right now because of the coronavirus stuff, or, or maybe you just in general are an anxious person and you deal with a lot of fear, there's a great message for you. Because really what we're gonna talk about is how the earliest followers of Jesus dealt with fear and anxiety. And they had a lot more to be scared about than we do. And so they, they found great peace through following Jesus. So make sure you lean into this message, let's learn a ton from it, and, and let, let's learn from Jesus' example. Let's get the peace that he offers through following him. Share that message with some friends. And man, let's stay connected, not just today, but throughout the week, we've got some exciting stuff planned for you throughout this week. So make sure you're following us on social media. Make sure that you're on the email list. Make sure we stay connected. We've got some great ways that we're gonna explore these next few weeks. We love you guys, and we will be back together soon. All right, love y'all. Peace. Grab a Bible, get to Philippians chapter four. All right, we're gonna be in Philippians four today. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's all right. Google it on your phone, look at a Bible app or something. I don't have the TV screen with the slides for you. So if you don't have any of those things, just listen really close. But Philippians 4, we're going to get there in just a second. But we've been in this series called On Edge, where we're dealing with uh, something that, you know, we should have dealt with a long time ago, truthfully. Like our society, and specifically within church culture, has been too silent on the issues of mental health and depression and anxiety. And so we've been digging into this because this really affects all of us. Right, like whether you've, whether you've ever been clinically diagnosed as depressed or as anxious, we all end up on edge, right? And especially around the holidays. I mean, come on, y'all know this is true, and there's actually science to back it up. Uh, back in 2011, there was a journal published called Innovations in Clinical Neuroscience, and they did a study that correlated the amount of reported instances of mental health issues with the holidays. Like, did you see an increase in, 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 in reported instances of anxiety and mental health issues or a decrease? And what they found was that before Christmas, there's a decrease that fewer people go to see mental health professionals before Christmas. But then after Christmas, there's a massive spike up. So what that tells us is that we all think that Christmas is going to make everything better. <laughs> we all think like a cup of Christmas cheer and a few presents exchanged is going to like solve all of our problems. But really what it does is we end up getting put on edge in the holidays. And some of you guys know that all too well because of Thursday because you just survived an awkward family dinner and you are walking in today on edge, right? Like maybe you had that crazy uncle 
They wouldn't stop talking politics. You're like, oh, sweet mother, can we please not do that this year? Or maybe, maybe you know, your kids were super messy and you and your spouse are just fighting and bickering back and forth and you found yourself underneath the dining room table cleaning up your kids' messes, fighting with your spouse. You're like, this is something out of a movie. Or maybe you're single and this was the year that you like officially reached your limits of the amount of times you're going to get asked, when are you going to get married? And you're like, ask, ask it again. Ask it again and see what I do. Whatever it is, you, 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 like the holidays have a way of putting you on edge. And, and let me say this, a side note. If you made it through your Thanksgiving dinner and you weren't put on edge, you might be the one that's putting everyone on edge. <laughs> it's a possibility. I just want to submit that for your consideration. Okay. Either way, we all end up on edge at some point. And so the question is, what do we do with that? Like, what, what do we do with our fears and our anxieties and our depression and our sad? Like, what do we do when we end up on edge? And so today what I want to show you is, I, I want to show you what the earliest followers of Jesus did with their anxiety. And, and that's a really big deal. Because the earliest followers of Jesus had every reason to be anxious. See, the earliest followers of Jesus were being persecuted for their faith. That many of them were actually shunned by their families because of their decision to follow Jesus. They were being physically hunted down and many of them were murdered because of their faith in Jesus. So if anyone had a, had a reason to be anxious, it was the earliest followers of Jesus. And so I, I want to show you what the earliest followers of Jesus did with anxiety. And then I want to just speak to you from my own story for a bit and, and the stories of many people that I've counseled over the years of, of how this verse that we're going to study has played out in my life and how I've dealt as a fellow struggler with depression and anxiety and mental health issues. And man, my hope for you today uh, if, you, if you walked in here today and you would consider yourself a follower of Jesus, my hope for you is that you walk out of here with a real practical path to peace. That you have something you can do with your anxiety. Like you have something you know, I can do this with my anxiety. Because anxiety is coming, knocking at your door one way or another. And so I want you to have a real practical path towards peace today. And if you're here and you wouldn't consider yourself uh, a follower of Jesus, man, my hope for you is that you just see that there, is, there are more than just reasons of, uh, of eternal security to consider following Jesus. That Jesus is not just concerned with your eternal salvation. Jesus is also concerned with your peace of mind. And so with that in mind, let's read Ephesians, or I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to take you on a different book today. Made you go to Philippians, we're going to go to Ephesians. No, we're back to Philippians, all right? <laughs> Philippians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 6 and 7, then we're going to pray, and we're going to unpack this thing and dig into it and get everything we can out of it, all right? Here's what Philippians 4 says. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your minds and your hearts in Christ Jesus. I'm going to read it one more time to you. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your minds and your hearts in Christ Jesus. Let's pray and ask Jesus to teach us today. Lord, we love you. And um, we're trusting you today. We're trusting that what you said about your word is true. That it's not irrelevant and outdated, but that it's living and active. And that it's sharper than any double-edged sword, that it can pierce our minds and pierce our hearts, and it can, it can change us from the inside out. And so, Jesus, we're asking you to do that today, to teach us, because there's a, there's a room full of us at every campus right now that are struggling with anxiety, we're struggling with depression, we're struggling with these issues, and we need you to teach us. And so, God, we pray that you would break the chains of, of, uh, of depression today, that, that people would walk out of here and, with a path to peace, not because of anything wise I say, but because of your word. But Jesus, we need you to show up today. So we open our minds and our hearts to you. And it's in your name that the church prays together. Amen. Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious. Don't you love when people say that? Like if you're anxious or depressed and someone's like, just stop. Gee, thanks. <laughs> Super helpful, right? Like, uh. Yeah, like I'm choosing to be Eeyore right now. Like it's, that's what I want. Of all the Winnie the Pooh characters I could pick to be, I would choose Eeyore. No, come on. Everybody knows Tigger's the man. Everybody wants to be Tigger. But it's, it's, not, just, it's not as easy as flipping a switch and being Tigger, right? And, and, and truthfully, we've heard that message for so long. Like if you're anxious, just stop worrying. If you're depressed, just stop being so sad. Just lift your head up and think better thoughts. Just think about good stuff. 
Like we've heard that message over and over, and, and it's not super helpful, but that's not what Paul says. He says, don't be anxious about anything, and then he actually gives you a path. He gives you a path to follow, and he says, Here, here's, here's what you need to do. In every situation, you need to go to God first. And, and that's so key, because he says, in, in, in every situation, you need to go to God first. You, you, you need to go to God first, not WebMD, that's going to convince you that you're dead in like two and a half hours. Not Google, not social media, not like your group text just yet. And, and, and truthfully, not, not first in order is even going to counseling or therapy or, or medication. I want to be very careful on saying that because just like Aaron said last week, and I, as someone who's been to therapy and been to counseling, and, and my wife and I have been down the path of medication, uh, as someone who's been there, it, it, that is God's gift. I mean, God's gift to the world are people that are brilliant enough to counsel us and, and give us therapy and people that are brilliant enough to come up with medication that can help solve chemical imbalances that are in our brains. That is a beautiful thing, and it's not a sin at all to go. Like, we should all be in counseling all the time. You know that, right? We should all be in counseling all the time. Whether you're going through it or it's preventative, we should all be in it all the time. All the counselors are like, yeah, preach, boy. I hear you. Say it. We should all be there. But, like, but, uh, but all Paul's saying, and, and all I'm trying to say is, we shouldn't go there first. That when you feel anxious and when you feel scared and when you feel depressed, your first stop, first order of business should be to go to God. And, and I love the phrase he uses. He says, in every situation. Oh, man, in every situation. Because we don't treat God like that. I mean, come on now. Let's cut through the Christianese. Let's cut through like the spiritual mumbo jumbo. Let's cut through the like acting like we're better than we really are. What we typically do is we take the worst of the worst situations to God, don't we? We take the situation to him that we've tried every other way to solve it, and nothing else is working. And so hike the ball, throw the Hail Mary pass to the end zone, hope that God catches it. But truthfully, again, let's just cut through. Let's get real. When we go and take God those situations, we don't actually believe he's going to do anything. It got super quiet in here. We don't actually believe, I mean, like, it's like a desperation attempt, right? Because we just wait, and we, 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 we wait to take anything to God until it's just the crisis that can't be solved, the massive issue. Paul says, no, no, that's actually not how it should work. Actually, what you should do, what I, what I should do is we should take every situation to God, the big ones and the small ones. And everything in between. You should take every, every time you feel the slightest bit of anxiety or fear or depression, you should take it to God. No matter how big or how small it is. Because Paul knew that what we need more than anything else is a shared history with God. We need a shared history. We, we need to be able to like look back on some times when God has carried us through so that we can have the confidence to stand firm in our current circumstances, so we can have the confidence to face our current anxieties. We need some shared history. I, I, I liken this to my dad. Uh, maybe you've got a dad like this. My dad was like this when I was growing up, and he's still like this to this day. He's a very handy man, all right, very handy man, very hard worker. And so growing up, he hated to pay anyone, like a professional, to come and fix something at the house that he could fix on his own. Anybody else like this? Anybody else have a, have, have a, have a dad like this? Yeah. And so I just always saw him like with like strong work ethic, figuring stuff out and not paying professionals to do it. I've tried to apply the same principles in my adult life, and it is not working out. <laughs> my wife doesn't even think it's attractive anymore when I try. She's like, babe, babe, just stop. Gosh, just call the contractor. It's, you're awful at this. But I'm trying, okay, I'm trying. But my, my dad would, though, I mean, my dad never wanted to pay for someone else to come and do the work that he could do himself and that he could figure out on his own, except for when it came to cars, Cars were the one spot that my dad was like, uh-uh, out of my skill set, out of my range, above my pay grade, no way. What you need to do is you need to go to Tommy, all right? Now, Tommy was the mechanic that my dad went to when I was growing up all the time. Now, Tommy had no teeth, but Tommy could fix cars like a beast. He was a wizard as a mechanic. He was incredible. And so my dad would just, he always went to Tommy. Any car issue, take it to Tommy. And anytime my car had an issue, no worries, take it to Tommy. Anytime my mom's car had an issue, take it to Tommy. He's got it. You see, my dad had taken the car to him for so long that they had a shared history. And so my dad knew he can probably fix it, and he's not going to give me a, a, a bad deal. He's not going to charge me too much. There was, there was trust there, right? There was a shared history, and, and that's what Paul's saying you need to have with God. You need to take every situation, both big and small, to God and say, God, here, here it is. 
And, 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 and because shared history develops trust. And oh man, you want to put your anxiety at ease? Trust. Oh, you want to put your fears at ease? Trust. Trust is the path. Because trust, like you know that you know it's going to be okay. Like even if it doesn't turn out like I think it's going to, it's going to be okay. See, like take take that mechanic illustration and go the other route with it. How many of you, by show of hands, at, at at all of our campuses, have ever taken your car to a mechanic that you'd never been to before? You know how anxiety inducing that is, right? You're going to take your car to the mechanic and say, hey, it's not working right. And you know what's going to happen. Four hours later, that dude is calling you. And he is for sure going to rattle off a list of things that are broken with your car, none of which sound like car parts, right? Like the rotary binary snake tube is broken in half. The flux capacitor is leaking nuclear waste. It's going to cost five grand at least until I get in there and take this thing apart. I don't know. It could be ten grand. Somewhere in the five to ten grand. You're like, wait a minute. What is happening? And, and, and you don't trust him. Like, even if you pay the money to that guy to get it fixed, you still don't leave feeling at peace because you got no shared history. See, because you need to take every situation, big and small, to God. Not just the big, you need to take the big and the small ones and say, God, what do I do with this anxiety? What do I do with it? And what I've found in my own life and in many of the lives of people that I've ministered to over the years is that when you take your anxiety to God and you let God speak into it first, you start to understand why Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, called God a wonderful counselor. Because that's what he is. Oh, he's a wonderful counselor. Oh, man, he'll, he'll help you understand reality. And you understand that's the most important question to, to, to answer here. Like when you take your anxiety and your fear and your depression to God, you need to have God help you understand the answer to this all-important question, which is, God, why am I feeling this way? That's the question you need to get to the bottom of. When you've got an anxiety coming your way, a depression coming your way, a fear coming, why am I feeling this, God? You know, um, M. Scott Peck, a famous uh, American psychiatrist, he, he had this quote that I thought was fascinating. He said, mental health is the constant pursuit of reality. The, the relentless commitment to reality at all costs. Like you're going to dedicate yourself to figuring out what's really going on in my life, what's really happening. Because when you know what's really going on, when you know why you feel the way you feel, you can start to actually find answers. You actually start to do something about it and it provides a path to peace. And so what I want to do with the rest of our time is just to walk you through what happens when you take your anxiety to God. And what I found in my own life personally happens when you take your anxiety to God. Because typically there's one of three things that God has pointed out to me in my life and in the lives of many people that I've worked with. That when you feel anxious or when you feel afraid, there's three buckets usually. That's, that's kind of the, the root cause of your anxiety and your fear. See, sometimes when you take it to God and you ask him why do you feel this way, what, what you end up realizing with his help is that you are actually being convinced of some lies. That you're, you're feeling anxious because you're buying into and you have bought hook, line, and sinker a lie. And, 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 you know, the devil himself, our enemy, is a liar. That's like his profession. Jesus would say in John 8, 44, says that the, the devil is a liar. When he lies, it is consistent with his character. I don't know if there's a more condemning accusation. When you lie, it's consistent with your character. He, he, that's, the, that's the devil. He says he's, he's the father of lies. That's what he does. And many of us are, are feeling anxious and depressed and afraid on a regular basis because we have bought some lies. There are some lies that the, that, that the enemy has fed us, like your past defines you. Your, your, your past defines you. And, and not just that, your past disqualifies you. That you'll, you'll, you'll never make a difference now. You can never be used by God again. Your future is ruined because of your past. That's a lie. And it feeds our anxiety. Many of us have been fed this, this terrible, terrible lie that, you, that, that, that the way you feel right now is the way you're always going to feel. Oh, man, if there's one lie that the enemy would just love to convince you of and stir up all kinds of fear and anxiety, it's that you'll feel this way forever. It's, and that it's, it's never going away. I mean, some of us right now are being convinced of the lie that the worst possible scenario for your future is going to happen. I mean, how many of us, how, how many of us sit around at night and, and our mind wanders to the worst possible thing happening to you or your family or your kids? 
and we just get paralyzed by this fear of the unknown in the future, and, and the enemy just convinces you that your future is dark, it's not bright, that your best days are behind you, that you're headed for heartache and hurt. There, 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 are, there are some lies in there. There's, there. there's little lies in there that you've been convinced of. And so when, when, when you take your anxiety to God and he points out a lie that you're being convinced of, the only thing that you can do and the thing you should do in response is to reject it. You should reject the lie. You, you should put it in its place. And see, what I find so fascinating about this is that when it comes to our relationship with God, what happens mostly is that we typically, as followers of Jesus, we talk to God, but we listen to our lies. We talk to God like crazy about our, about our issues. Like, God, why do I feel this way? Oh. God, please take it away. God, God I, I, God, I wish I didn't think these crazy thoughts. God, please help me not feel so sad. God, help me be not, to, 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 to not be so anxious. God, God, please take it away. We talk to God about it. But then in the quiet moments, we actually listen to the lie. We let the lie tell us how we should feel. We let the lie tell us what's reality. We, we let the lie guide us and determine our steps. And you see, if you want to reject the lies of the enemy, you need to flip those. See, instead of talking to God and listening to your lies, you need to listen to God and talk to your lies. You need to listen to God. I mean, I'm, like you, can, you can talk to him. You can talk to him for sure, but you should probably do more listening. You, like we, we would be well served to sit down with our Bibles and just like let God tell us what truth is and just like listen to him a little bit and say, God, like, like what do you think about my situation? We should listen to God more, and then I'm telling you, we should talk to our lies. Even if it makes you look like a crazy person. I'm talking, like, you should, you should talk out loud to your lies. And, and if you're worried about how you're going to look to, like, the car next to you or the person in the grocery store, just throw in some headphones. It'll look like you're on a phone call. <laughs> you're, like, pushing your grocery cart, doing your thing. Like, man, that person's having a really intense conversation. You're right. I'm talking to the devil right now. <laughs> you need to talk to your lies, though. You need to put them in their proper place. When you have the lie whispered in your ear that your past defines you and your past disqualifies you, you need to, in your car, before you get out and go to work every morning, say out loud, no, I am forgiven, I am loved, I am redeemed, I, I, I am not my past. God has a future for me. He has a purpose for me. I, I am, I am no, there's no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No, that's a lie. I reject it. When, when, when you feel the lie whispered in your ear that you're going to feel this way forever, you say, no, 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 no. Out loud, I'm speaking some truth right now. Out loud, you say to that lie, my heart is deceitful and wicked above all else. It can't be trusted. And no emotion lasts forever. And, and the Holy Spirit is alive and active in me, which means I'm being grown. I'm being changed. There is nothing about me that will stay the same forever. God is, he, he's doing a work inside of me, and he's not going to quit until it's done. I mean, you keep talking that lie. You're like, you become a preacher in your car. Tell the lie. What's up? Put it in its place. When you feel the lie that, that the worst of the worst is going to happen to you, you need to speak out loud. No, I actually serve a God who calls himself a good father. And, and, and it's a good father who loves to give good gifts for, for his children. And that doesn't mean that everything's going to turn out perfect, but it does mean that he's going to be with me always. And it does mean that he has a plan to prosper me, to give me a hope, to give me a future. That God has good things in store for me. That I can trust him. I can look to the future with great anticipation, not dread. See, and I'm telling you, when you get convinced of some lies and you start rejecting them, I had to straighten that up because that was bothering me. Some stuff just gets at me, man. <laughs> We're talking about being on edge. When those lines aren't straight, I'm on edge. Back off. <laughs> when you get convinced of some lies and you start rejecting them and you start listening to God and talking to your lies and putting them in their place, you watch peace will follow. I'm not saying it's going to solve everything, but watch peace that transcends understanding that you can't even truly explain. Watch peace follow. You see, so there's, there's sometimes when it's, it's not that. And I want to say this next one very carefully. Because sometimes when I've taken, and I, I say this as someone who has, a, I've, I've had personal experience. I'm not saying this about something I have not experienced. So I want you to say that. It's for me first and foremost. But this next one has been abused and misapplied oftentimes. And so I want to be careful with it. 
But oftentimes when you take your anxiety and your fears to God, you say, God, why do I feel this way? It's not that you're being convinced of a lie. It's actually that you're being convicted of some truth. I don't like that one either. I don't put it like that. (laughs) Deal with it. I want to be very careful on this one, though, because I'm telling you, so many of us for so long have heard the message that you're anxious and depressed because there's sin in your life. And that was actually, for many of us, a lie that we were being convinced of. And that wasn't true. But just because it's been misabused or misapplied and abused doesn't mean that we should dismiss it entirely. Because what I've found is that sometimes when sin in our life goes unchecked and we're unrepentant and we do not address it, we do not confess it, um, it actually can have a physical effect on our bodies. In Psalm chapter 38, King David, the most prominent character in the Old Testament, he actually speaks to this when he talks about his sin. He says this, I find this fascinating. He says, your arrows, God, have struck deep and your blows are crushing me. Because of your anger, my whole body is sick. And here it is. My health is broken because of my sins. My guilt overwhelms me. It is a burden too heavy to bear. Have you ever felt that before? My wounds fester and stink because of my foolish sins. I'm bent over and racked with pain. All day long I walk around filled with grief. A raging fever burns within me. My health is broken. I am exhausted and completely crushed. And my groans come. From an anguished heart. David had some, some sin in his life, some things he was being convicted of that needed to change, and it was causing him to have such, such remorse and such, it was like a physical reaction. He was anxious, he was overwhelmed with it. I mean, so many times when I'm meeting with people, I'll, I'll sit there and listen to you know, this person who you know, looks like they got their life all together, and then I'll hear them talk, and they're like, man, I'm just so miserable. I know it all looks like it's put together, but I'm, I'm anxious, I have no peace, I'm miserable, I hate my life, I hate my job, I hate, it, it's all going back. I just, I don't have any peace, I hate the way I feel. Only to find out a little bit deeper in the conversation that they're neck deep in a porn addiction that spanned multiple decades. And it's like, man, yeah. Yeah, that, you're not going to feel right. You keep, you keep walking through the mud like that and living so far from the life that God wants for you, it's going to hurt. Um, you keep hopping on the gossip train and talking about your coworkers and your friends and your family in a, in a disparaging way, you're going to feel anxious. Um, you, know, you, you, keep, you keep cutting corners at work and cheating to get ahead, maybe cheating people out of some money or some, some, some promotions, yeah, you, you're not going to feel right when you lay your head on your pillow. Because God's trying to convict you of some things that need to change in your life. And so when we take our anxiety to God and, and he gently reveals this to us, the only thing that we have to do, and, and I know this is a word that a lot of people don't like, but I actually find it to be a beautiful word now. But the, the, the thing we need to do is we need to repent. We need to, we need to look at that sin in our life and we need to express our remorse to God. And then we need to do everything we can to walk away from it. You know, that's, that's what the word repent means. This word has gotten such a bad rap in our culture because of so many churches that have misused it. It's so associated with hatred of people. This is, this is, the word repent means to turn and walk away. Turn and go in a different direction. God convicts you that something needs to change in your life and then you do everything you can to walk away from it. Everything you can to build the boundaries in your life so that you never go back. You, you take your sin and you drag it out into the light, kicking and screaming, and you confess it to a trusted brother or sister. And let me tell you, this is why I say repent is such a beautiful word. Because when you do that, when you walk away from the sin in your life that you're being convicted of and you repent of it and you do everything you can to kill it, you confess it, you will experience freedom like you have never experienced before. You will experience joy and hope and peace and life. You'll have a pep in your step. Man, you'll come into worship like raising both hands, trying to raise your feet to worship. It, it's going to get crazy in here because you're just be, it, it, the weight will be lifted off of you because you're starting to walk in the ways of the Lord. And, and, and that, that's what happens. When God tells you, hey, I want something to change, and you react to it. That's why it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's, it's the grace of God at work in your life. God loves you too much to let you stay here. 
We see sometimes there's still, there's still one more. Because sometimes it's not a lie that we're being convinced of. It's not, it's not a, a truth we're being convicted of. Sometimes when we feel anxious and depressed, and this next one's so hard, it's, it's just not, it's not a fun one to talk about. Sometimes we, what's happening in our lives when we feel anxious or fearful or depressed, we're not being convinced of a lie, we're not being convicted of a truth. We're being confronted by reality. We're being confronted by something that, I mean, there's no easy explanation for it. It's just hard. Like, cancer sucks. There's nothing else you can say about it. Like, betrayal is the worst. You didn't do anything to deserve it. Getting laid off at work, not because of poor performance, but because of budget cuts. You didn't do anything to deserve that. That's just horrible. You you didn't plan on that happening. It's just a reality of our broken world that you get confronted by. And man, some of this stuff that God walks us through, like, I mean, some of us are going to get, some of us are going to take our anxieties and walk it through, and we're going to get confronted with the reality that we have some things within our minds and our bodies, some chemical imbalances that we need to get treated. And that's a reality that we could be confronted by, and that's, that's really tough. That, that hurts. It's just part of the fragile nature of our bodies. And on this side of eternity, this is the stuff we have to deal with. Like death, I mean, suffering through the death of a loved one is a reality that you get confronted by, and it is painful. Painful. You see, it, 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 when, when, you, when you've gone through stuff like this, you understand why King Solomon would write this in Ecclesiastes 3. He, 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 he says there's a time for everything, and he pairs all these good things that happen in life with all these bad things that happen in life. Right? Ecclesiastes 3, he says this. He says, for everything there's a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, which is hard work and, and difficult, and a time to harvest, which is awesome, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down and to build up, to cry, to laugh, to grieve, to dance, to scatter stones and gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to quit searching. A time to keep, to throw away, to tear, to mend, to be quiet, to speak, to love, to hate. A time for war, a time for peace. Like there are just some things in life that are so awesome and they're so joy filled and they're incredible. They're like nothing could get you down in those moments because it's incredible. Life is awesome. And then there's some things in life that are just very, very difficult. And it's just a reality you get confronted by. And there's nothing you can do to change it. But that's why in those moments, the thing that you can do and the thing that is helpful that leads to peace is to remember the promises of God. See, some of you all right now are going through like some really, really difficult circumstances. Like some of you right now are quite frankly just exhausted because of the life that you've had to walk through over this past season. And and in the back of your mind, you've got this question, this fear, this anxiety of like, will I ever recover from this? Or will I always be this exhausted? Will I always be this hurt? Will I always be this sad? You need to remember in that, like you're confronted by a tough reality. You didn't do anything to, 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 to deserve that, but you need to remember the promise of God. You need to remember in Matthew 11 when Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Not I might, not I'll try, I will give you rest. You will recover from what you're currently going through. It's a promise that God has given you. He's given you that. And you've got to remember it. Like, like some of you right now are facing some, some sickness in your family or personally. Some, some death, some loss, some grief. And, and, and that's a reality you're confronted by. But you need to remember Revelation 21 where he says, There is coming a day when he will wipe away every tear from every eye. There will be no more sickness, no more sadness, no more death. All those things will be gone. It's a guarantee. It's a promise. This, what, what we're living through right now will not last forever. See, some of you right now are, are in the middle of circumstances that like, you can't logically solve on your own how it's going to work out. And, and you're looking to your future right now, and you're super worried. You're worried about like, how the money's going to work out. You're worried about how, how the whole family thing's going to work out. You're worried about your career, and you don't know what's going to happen. And, and in, in Romans 8, you need to remember that God has promised us that he will work all things together for the good of those who love him. That if you love him, he's going to take your circumstances and he's going to work them together for your good. 
You can look to the future with confidence. That's a tough reality to, 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 to be confronted with. But, but you can remember that when life hits you like a ton of bricks, God says, I love you. And I know this hurts, but I've been through a ton of hurt myself, God would say. I, I've lost a child before. I've watched children that I love walk away from me. I, I, I've endured all kinds of hardship, and, and I promise you right now, I promise you, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you to the end. And you need to remember that when life confronts you. And see, this, this, is the path, this is a path to peace right here. You take your anxiety, your fear, your depression, you say, God, help me, wonderful counselor, help me understand why I'm feeling this way. And he either says, hey, you're being convinced of some lies that you need to reject, or you're being convicted of some truth, some, some sin in your life that you need to repent of, or you're being confronted with a reality that I'm going to walk with you and need to remember, to, to remember my promises to you. And you see, th this is the path to peace. And, and, and it's not the path to peace because it's like, Petey's brilliant brainchild has solved peace all who want peace come to Petey. No. It's because this is just hope. You know that, right? Like, that's the word we're talking about, is hope. Like, there's hope if you'll walk away from your sin. God can lead you out of that. There's hope when you remember God's promises. He's, he, he is not done. He is very much so at work, and he wins in the end. And there is hope when you reject the lies of the enemy and you live in his truth. There is hope. And, man, hope is the word. Because so much of our mental health issues are a result of hopelessness. When you're anxious, when you're fearful, when you're afraid, it's because you don't have hope. And, and that's why I just believe, man, I believe so confidently that right now the church is poised to shine like never before. You know that one in five Americans uh, say that they struggle with mental health issues like depression and anxiety. And so just let me do the math for you. That's 65 million. There's 65 million people in our country that are looking for peace, that are looking for hope, and they don't know where to turn. And that's what gives me so much confidence that God has the church positioned for such a time as this. Because you, you want to know who's got the market cornered on hope? The church. When Jesus walked out of a grave... A dead man came back to life. The, the worst circumstances, it was over. He said, no, it, 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 it's not over. Trust me, there's hope. Hope on that day received a name, the name of Jesus. And we've got the market cornered on it. We can share it with the world. We get to shine bright right now. I'm telling you, that's why I'm not afraid of depression anymore. I'm not afraid of anxiety. I have seen God do too much, and I believe he still has work to do. I believe there's still work to be done. Can you imagine 65 million people coming to know Jesus? All because the church stood up and said, yep, we struggle too, and we found peace. We found hope. And the path to peace, the path to hope, runs through Jesus. Come and follow with us. Come and see with us. That's what I'm telling you right now. No, no matter what campus you're at, if you struggle with mental health issues, we need to flip the script on this thing. I mean, for too long, when you find out that someone struggles with depression or anxiety, it's like, oh, poor them. Oh, what, what, what a victim. You know what, I'm kind of done with the victim mentality. Because I actually think that I'm poised and positioned for impact. I think I'm poised and positioned because of my misery to do great ministry. I think there's people that need to hear the message of hope. So I'm saying right now, if you struggle, God wants to use you in that struggle. God wants to use you to impact people all across your neighborhood, all across your workplace. I'm telling you, we are the hope of the world because we got Jesus. And so right now, I want to pray for us in that. I want to pray that God would use us. And so I, I want to pray a, a prayer of empowerment and courage over anyone that's struggling right now. And so I want, at all of our campuses, all of our heads bowed, eyes closed. And if you struggle with anxiety, depression, any sort of mental health issue, I just want you real quietly in your lap, just kind of open your hands up like you're about to receive something. And I just want to pray that God gives you the courage and the strength to take this, this mess that you feel like you're in and to let him use it to be your message to the world that needs it. Jesus, we love you. Oh, and we, we're so grateful for you. Jesus, if you never did another thing for us, we would have all we need in you. But we know that you want more for us. 
that you just you, you aren't just here to save us for all of eternity that you actually want to give us peace that transcends all understanding and then you want to use us you 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 don't just want to give us peace for our benefit you want to give us peace for the benefit of the world that needs you and so god we come before you now as a, as a church fully surrendered ready to be used by you god i pray for everyone in the audience right now at every campus that's struggling with depression right now that you'd break those chains the struggling with anxiety that you'd break those chains, God, that you would help them to walk down a path towards peace that transcends all understanding. And then God, send us out and use us. Help us to be ambassadors of hope in a world that desperately needs it. God, we need you to meet us in these moments. Minister to our hearts. We love you, Jesus. And the church prays together. Amen.